Yes. Uh, I have a question uh, about the what you were just talking about about the yield curve um, as, as is commonly accepted. Once it becomes inverted, it's a forecast of a, uh, of a recession to come or, or a recession. Uh, is the um, does that result be actually? If I could, I just take a moment and draw this. Forty-five dollars. Yeah. Forty-five bucks. <laughs> Cash. Cash. Yeah. Uh, if it's if it's in two phases, let's say, and the and the uh, the yield curve goes into uh, uh, inversion, is it is it the fact that and you were saying the bids disappear for the long bonds because nobody wants to nobody wants to take the risk of investing long term? Is it the uh, the fact that those bids disappear and it becomes a cascading effect, and then then the interest rate along because the price of the bond falls, the interest rate snaps up too dramatically. Is it the the acceleration of that, the destabilization of the interest rate, that is actually what causes the damage to the economy? Because then, of course, as the yield curve readjusts, it may end up you know with long rates instead of the proper three or four percent, they end up at ten or twelve or uh, or whatever. Am I am I understanding the basics of what you were saying there? Well, when you say that it's a predictive tool, the inversion, I am I'm not so sure that it's not the other way around. It's not just predicting it, it's causing, causing it. Causing. So there's a causality connection, and that's how I would approach it. So could you reformulate your question, well, taking this into account that there is a causal relationship, so that these are not independent events, they are linked somehow, perhaps we don't know. Well I guess, yeah, that the way I, I'm going to actually later on, I'm going to show you with about six different charts what, to see if my argument is right, but because I'd love to be able to present this to the investment advisors, because they do all look at the yield curve, or most of them, but if I were to reformulate it, I would say, okay, assuming that the illicit interest rate, uh, interest rate discount arbitrage by the acceptance house, assuming that that's going on, and assuming it gets out of hand, causing the discount rate to actually rise above the rate of interest, is it that then that triggers not a gradual adjustment back as the bond bids disappear, but a dramatic mm. adjustment back, causing a temporarily a very steep yield curve, mm. which uh, completes that sort of the, the second punch of the one-two punch that hurts the economy uh, because now suddenly uh, rather than there being no uh, interest or no um, well, I guess it's sort of part of the same process isn't it it, 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 it it's just the first there's nobody who's willing to loan into the loan money out at all and then when the money lenders reappeared they were only willing to, to uh, lend it out at 12 15 percent interest which is crushingly damaging to the to the factory owners to the industrialists that were still operating because now as you said it destroys the value of their uh, investments they previously made so am i am i explaining that properly uh, uh, yeah uh, i i would say it sounds good to me but you know this was not really uh, part of our offering here because the yield curve is basically about interest rates. It would be wrong to say that the very beginning of the yield curve is this country. That this would be wrong. So uh, the, the more work has to be done before you can incorporate this. But I I don't see anything objectionable in, in what you are suggesting. And certainly confidence is a big part of this thing, which can be destroyed, it's very fragile, and once it's destroyed, it takes a long time to rebuild it. And that's all part of it. Now, whether that can be put into, in terms of equations and curves, that's another question. I think to some extent it is possible, and that's a good way. So, uh, if you make a video out of the yield sure. curve, this would be much better. <laughs> so you would have to make an animation, animation of the yield curve, and see that in various scenarios how it changes its shape. 
think I think what I'm going to do later, just to help my own understanding and maybe use it as a, as a tool of interest with the advisors I speak to, is I want to show what the world looked like in 1700 before the before the acceptance house or the banks came up, what it looked like before, just before the Federal Reserve came in, and then the effect of the Federal Reserve tinkering with the, the short-term discount rate, uh -huh. and uh -huh. also the end carry trade effect on the long yeah. but I'll show that to you later. Yes, please. Uh, there is on the web a place that has a video of the web curve. If you do a Yahoo or a Google on web curve, you come to some and it says, do you want to see a dynamic web? Uh, yield curve. Yield curve. And it shows you over the years how the thing wiggles around and where the fixed point is, where the Fed or somebody's holding it steady and the rest goes, no, very interesting. And I, I just want to say, I think in any suppression scheme, when you keep something down for long enough, at one point it's going to get away. And, and that's sort of what's happening there. Maybe the same as with the price of gold. Go to that Yahoo and do it. It's very interesting to see that yield curve, what it does. Very good. Other questions? <clears throat> All right, then we continue. Uh, the topic is borrowing short to lend long. It's in the original schedule. It's Lecture number 12, of course, uh, we have upset the order, but that's what I'm planning to do now. And I continue with the gr second greatest story ever told, so in the same setting, the uh, conspiracy of the Miller and the Baker, which backfired, they were blacklisted at the discount house and then they had their revenge uh, starting the uh, acceptance house. Having bur burnt their fingers once before, the Miller and Baker proceeded very cautiously. They understood very well the inherent danger that the bill market may reject their anticipation and accommodation bills. Therefore, they insisted that their customers post collateral security. We can now print our own money, gloated the miller. When we accept accommodation bills, we borrow at the lower discount rate in order to lend at the higher interest rate. We simply pocket the difference between the two. It's mana from heaven, the baker added gleefully. And if our customers fall on hard times and they can't pay their debts, no harm done, we shall pay on their behalf from the proceeds of their collateral. So everything looked very promising from their point of view. The miller and the baker went out creating bills merely for the sake of discounting them without any regard to the economic <coughs> factors below, without any regard to producing goods for consumption. <coughs> so th they uh, went into this lucrative business in order to make these accommodation bills more attractive to the prospective buyer, they invented goods and sent them on imaginary trips around the globe. They thought that chances of exposure of the fraud were non-existent. They would never ever allow their customers to be formed and the public to learn about it. They would routinely pay off the debt as it matured without any objection and get compensation by selling the collateral. If the market value of the collateral fell, the acceptance house would issue a margin call. So what I mean is before maturity, here was this uh, accommodation bill, and halfway before maturity, 
uh, there was a collateral posted at the acceptance house, okay, which was roughly t twice uh, uh, the market value of which was roughly twice the face value of this uh, accommodation bill. But of course, during that 91 days, it is possible that the value of the collateral fell. And if that's what happened, then the acceptance house issue would, would issue a margin call, which means that you have to post more collateral in order to have your bill not revoked. Okay. Now, if the uh, uh, if the acceptor of that accommodation bill did not post the margin call then they, the uh, acceptance house would immediately liquidate the collateral. So there was a punishment, they, and, and most uh, acceptors would, would have felt that they would just uh, post the additional uh, collateral. In other words, they th thought, the conspirators thought, that they were covered all around. There was just no, uh, the scheme was watertight. <coughs> For a time, it looked as if the baker and the miller have indeed succeeded in inventing the perfect, f perfect fraud. The sky was the limit to the profits to be made <coughs> in the acceptance business, as only human imagination could limit the type and quantity of goods to be invented for the purposes of drawing and discounting. Unfortunately, there was a fly in the ointment. What the baker and the miller forgot to consider was that their profit depended on the positive spread between the interest rate and the discount rate. And as the accepting business grew, and there were imitators, other acceptance houses opened up, more and more uh, accommodation and anticipation bills were put into circulation, with the result that the spread got narrower and narrower. And why? Because remember, they were selling the bill and buying how was that buying the bond now when you sell the bill the price moves inversely the price goes down when you buy the bond the price of the bond goes up but the interest rate moves in the opposite direction so actually it's narrowing and getting closer to zero. And as it does, and that's the problem, uh, the business becomes less and less profitable. <clears throat> so that was the fly in the ointment. <clears throat> as more and more fictitious bills were put into circulation, the spread narrowed, the acceptance house was forced to accept even more fictitious bills in order to maintain its customary profit margin. This made the spread to narrow further. Clients were caught up in the squeeze and were first for forced to forfeit their collateral. The burden of the fraud was shifted to the mortgage market and ultimately to the real estate market. That is assuming that so much of the collateral was uh, mortgages or real estate uh, investment related in some ways. Then, then uh, as the collateral uh, as as the collateral had to be had to be supplemented, the the uh, burden was shifted to the 
mortgage and the real estate market. There is some similarity to the conditions which obtain in our present crisis. One day the miller came home with the bad news. You can buy real estate as cheap as stinking mackerel, he said to the baker. We had better liquidate all the mortgages in our portfolio before the owners walk away from their properties, which can happen, as you know. <laughs> but it was too late. There were no more takers for first mortgage on prime commercial real estate that for third uh, <laughs> I read it again. There were no more takers for the first mortgage on prime commercial real estate than for third mortgages on a farm in the moon. <laughs> <laughs> the acceptance house too was forced into liquidation. Against all the rosy predictions, it went down in defeat. The conspiracy of the miller and the baker collapsed once more. The worst aspect of the disaster was that it victimized a lot of innocent bystanders, owners of real estate who had nothing to do with the fraud and the conspiracy, but who nevertheless suffered real losses because of it. So that's the relevant chapter in the second greatest story ever told. Ever told. It's clear that the accept the it's clear that accepting anticipation and accommodation bills amounts to illicit interest arbitrage. That should be clear. So it's just uh, another name for borrowing short and lending long. The drawers of these bills should be properly, should go to the bond market. In other words, those who borrow short, they should really borrow long. You know, if you plan to land long, then you have to borrow long, matching maturities. This is, this is uh, now right in the focus. And if you don't, because you believe that you always be able to roll forward your maturing accommodation bills, then uh, you are wrong and very soon you will find out on your own high that this is uh, not going to work forever. You just have to be lucky. Okay, so the proper way of financing long-term project is borrow long-term, and then you avoid all this trouble, and that should be enacted in legislation. The trouble is that this wasn't, and uh, people thought that it was perfectly good and honest uh, business practice to borrow short and learn long. What amazes me is that <laughs> this lesson still hasn't sunk in, because all this, the present day crisis, is about borrowing short and lending long. And nobody, at least I have not cross, come across a single reference, whether on the internet or in the uh, mainstream financial press, which would put the finger on it. Perhaps we should investigate whether it's a good idea to finance mortgages going to the commercial paper market, which, which is one thing that was involved. This question wasn't asked. Well, gosh, how many more crises we have to go through before somebody in authority will ask this question and also ask the next question. Why is it that proper legislation was not proposed to rule out such deals, borrowing short to lend long, which is a deal which cannot succeed by the force of logic. It contradicts 
logically. If you borrow short, it means you have to come up with the payment before you, your own investment pays off. So then you have to roll it over and again and again. Now, if you were lucky once or lucky twice or even lucky three times, is that a guarantee that you will be lucky the fourth time? That you can borrow at the same terms because this investment is locked in and that's maturing frequently. So, if your terms of borrowing short deteriorate before this thing matures, then you're in trouble. Then you're in trouble. And chances are that they will deteriorate because there will be imitators. If, if you make money by trying to pick the spread between the discount rate and the rate of interest, then other people won't take long before they say, gee, I want to try that too. It's all gravy. I don't have to do anything. Just borrow short and lend long. And as this happened, the terms of borrowing short will deteriorate. And, and that's quite predictable. It's quite logical. And that's when the scheme uh, runs aground. Because it will not be possible to uh, roll over on the same favorable terms, the short-term loan, and eventually you might even have to uh, borrow short at a disadvantage in terms which are definitely unfavorable. And that's when you are in trouble, and that's what happened to these guys, the uh, Miller and the Baker. <coughs> So this kind of arbitrage is illicit, it's illegitimate, and more generally uh, we can just state this as an axiom that legislation should rule out borrowing short to learn long. Now, there are those of free market minded economists who claim that the crusade against borrowing short to lend long is a witch hunt. They suggest that the practice cannot be condemned on economic grounds any more than risk taking in general can. And we know risk taking is necessary. It, it cannot be uh, eliminated, uh, no matter how desirable it looks. That would be nice if we could provide for all the needs of society by producing and uh, no risks involved. That would be very nice, but this is a pipe dream. It's not possible and we don't have to go into the reasons why it's not possible. So. These so-called free-minded, free market economists would say, well, let competition prevail. Let the best guy, the starkest, the smartest guy win the jackpot. They see that the position which I am representing here at best is a moral judgment, at worst, an effort to stifle competition. It is not for the economist to make a moral judgment. Economic, uh, uh, economics is a science and you have to keep scientific judgment apart from moral judgment. If you start mixing the two then you can uh, get into hot water very quickly. No, you reach moral science. <laughs> well, that's... <Yeah. laughs> All right, I, I, I got it, I got it. You are criticizing me and this is just no. because, yeah. because Adam Smith was uh, yeah. uh, chair, uh, chairing the f uh, philosophy uh, of uh, moral, moral, moral philosophy, yeah, think, yeah. so he could f fit it in. Uh, but 
uh, I guess, and I love philosophy, we talked about it, right? And uh, a large part of my interest in uh, economics comes from this philosophical angle. Uh, but um, if we had more time to go into this, I could defend the position that uh, uh, we are really talking about extremes. On one extreme, you say that uh, moral philosophy has absolutely no part in economics. Or you can say, well, we can moralize all the time, and that's going to improve economics. Now, these are extremes. Somehow, uh, middle <coughs> ground has to be reached where you, <coughs> uh, you are proceeding ethically, and at the same time, you are not uh, making a, an unacceptable moral <coughs> judgment. So let's just leave this, because that would take us too far away. There's no need to quarrel with the statement that uh, moral, that you cannot dismiss economics on the basis of moral judgment. But to say that the case against borrowing short to lend long has nothing to do with economics shows a profound lack of understanding of the market process. First, we must make it clear that the dispute is not about limiting risk taking. This is not what the dispute is about. Uh, uh, it's accepted that risk-taking is part of economics. There is no uh, economic progress without somebody taking the risk. Uh, but the dispute is about a predictable uh, deterioration of business conditions which your own action brings about. So this is increasing risks in a perfectly unacceptable way. And that's what the discussion is about. <clears throat> the proposition that borrowing short to land long ought to be outlawed is not an effort to stifle competition any more than is the proposition that misrepresenting the quantity or quality of products offered for sale or ought to be outlawed. Economics does not criticize speculation and other forms of risk taking as long as the risk taker uh, finances his speculative activity with his own funds or with borrowed funds for somebody who understands what is involved. What we criticize is passing the risk on uh, to innocent third parties and maybe whole communities and argue that the, uh, this is, oh, I love the term Alan Greenspan uses, unbundling risks and bundling risks. The high priest of the Federal Reserve is passing moral judgment on, on Bundling and unbundling risks, you see? As if, risks, <laughs> as if risks could be eliminated by re-bundling them. You just take the old bundle, open it, rearrange it, bingo! It's, the risk has disappeared. Wonderful, wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Just think about it. And uh, what's the name again of the author? Ang, uh, uh, you know, who wrote this series of papers criticizing Greenspan yesterday. Engel. William Engel. 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 Yeah, there is in the uh, Financial Sense website an author by the name William Engel. 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 Okay. And. It's, it's vitriolic. It's very <laughs> critical of Alan Greenspan and his tenure at the Fed. It's, uh, 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 there might be other authors who will write a better summary, but this so far beats every other criticism I have seen. And 
he goes into that bundling and unbundling. Uh, so I can recommend this. It's still ongoing because I think four parts have been published, but there's a fifth coming out, and maybe we, we will even continue. I highly recommend it. Okay. Social circulating capital is not owned by any individual or any group of individuals. It is communal property so to speak. It is property socialized in quotation mark and it, do, it is in the best sense of the word. It's not in the sense as politicians use it but it's the sense in the sense that certain uh, economic processes are such that for best results Communal ownership is preferable, and uh, th th there are any number of examples. The communal pastures in England or other countries, or even communal ownership of uh, stud animals, right? I mean, uh, every s farm cannot afford to have the highest quality of stud for the purposes of... Uh, but if the community invests common uh, in, in the common ownership of the highest quality, then this is obviously for all the better. So there are any number of uh, examples, but uh, I think the best example is social circulating capital. It would be too cumbersome. This is a fast-moving <coughs> process. The, uh, providing consumer goods for the uh, for the consumer, high uh, the, uh, the consumer goods are in high demand, and uh, moreover there is this uh, change, the capriciousness of the consumer, etc., etc. And for that reason, the best way to provide is to have a social circuit in capital, which is nobody's private property anymore, it's communal property, and it has to be protected as such, because communal property is always open to pilfering more than private property. So that's what's involved in here, and that's why you have to have uh, legislation which will limit uh, the, uh, the activities of the, uh, of those people who, are, who want to be too smart and pick, pick the spread between the interest rate and this country. This spread is not for picking, for private profit. It's a, uh, it's a kind of insurance for the community that low cost capital is available for those who want to satisfy the most urgent demands of the computer. That's what this spread is for, and it has to be protected. It cannot be picked by just anybody who smart Alec comes along. Okay. So the flip side of social circulating capital is the bill market. To dip into the bill market in order to raise funds without contributing anything to uh, the community, any value to the community, is the same as stealing communal property. Just what is uh, what is contribution to the community and what isn't is a question that cannot be decided by any individual. It can be decided, however, it can be decided by the bill market. The test is, as we have discussed it, is to to draw the paper, draw the bill, and see if the bill market will take it and will make it circulate. If it does, then you are all right. You are contributing something positive. But if the bill market rejects it, there's just no argument that your moral values dictate such and such because that's that's that is worth nothing. What is worth is the uh, final decision of the bill market. If it rejects your paper, your bill, 
then you are not contributing anything valuable to the communal effort. <coughs> so, this hmm? yeah. uh, Professor, this is, this is interesting because <coughs> we're moving over into that ground of, um, of, of ethics in, in a very real sense, we are. Mm -hmm. And um, there are many, many factors afoot, especially on the gold side, about freedom, free markets, and what this means. And it, right before you introduced this idea of outline this kind of arbitrage, I knew immediately that what you were going to posit was going to, would be attacked by, quote, the forces of freedom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, to say this is, this is, this is, stop free markets, this is, un, this is coercive, all right? And it's, it's, to me, it's fascinating in listening to you draw this thing up, because there's a very critical distinction that you're drawing here, and, and I, and, 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 in truth, to me, it seems as if, it seems truly that you're saying that commerce is a social activity, and that commerce as a social activity benefits everyone in the society. Mm -hmm. It benefits society as a whole, producers, savers, the participants. It's our, it's our collective, uh, it's our collective benefit. benefit, and that's what it is. All right, mm. and and so the, um, wh wh you know, as I've seen this this economy move, because when I was young, you never heard anything. Well, mm. I'm 63 now, but when I was young, you never heard anything about a service economy. And all of a sudden, <laughs> you started hearing things about a service economy. I, I, really, I began wondering, what was this thing they were talking about? What was a service economy? <laughs> you know, is it hospital? Flipping hamburger. Uh, flipping hamburger, yeah. You know, is it, you know, just serving people? Well, if it is, it could be best described as self-service. <laughs> you know, that's really what it is. is that, and, and I think what you're saying here is that what these people have done, what the, the service industry has done is come on, hook themselves on, as a parasite onto this collective enterprise that we have, and, it, and it, it gotten into it like a worm. <laughs> and it's taken so much out of it that the body itself is now diseased and is in danger of dying. And there, there are limits to what this should be allowed to do. And, and this is something that this society is going to have to come to grasp with and look at in terms of freedom. Are there, in, in this way, the limitations on it and the reasons for it. I mean, I, I remember years ago before there was even a danger of this thing collapsing, um, Frank Veneroso, one of the top you know, financial strategists predicted in the late 1990s. This is before this, the, the egregious you know, activities of the 2000s come along. He said, when America wakes up, when the world wakes up to what the community has done to it, there is going to be a draconian backlash. And they may throw out the baby with the bathwater. But he said, when they find out, really, I mean, I, this is second hand that we heard from somebody who said that. And I, and I thought about it. I thought, here's a person from the center of the, 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 that financial world who sees what they're doing, and that we, we're going to get to a thing of where there's just going to be a, a huge reaction against the excesses that have happened. And what uh, Professor Fekete has pointed out is it shouldn't be excessive because that would damage the system further. But it should, th th there has to be. D d uh, constraints placed upon excess of the, of the um, humanities excess, and this is the point at which it should be done. So, by community, in, in your use of the word there, you mean the financial community? Us as a whole. The no, because the financial community is not going to service itself. They will not. They will never. The financial community, as responsible as they are for the part they play in this, does not have the wherewithal or the desire to constrain itself. It is going to be constrained by other forces that have been damaged by their activities. And it is quite possible that this reaction is going to be so excessive it is only going to further damage the system itself. And that's why I think what Professor Fekete is putting out here is saying this is one area that if you protect it, the whole thing may, may be healthy. Thank you. Now, I want to give you a textbook example of the fate of a real acceptance house uh, which existed and it was called Baring Brothers in London which collapsed in 1890 so that's an, 
an old story, but still very relevant. By the way, the, they the, can't the, forget. The, the name, Nick, Nick the name has been it, it, dug it, it up it and used, re used, recycled again. <laughs> yeah. It just occurred to me that the more recent, this is not the recent bearing collapse. Uh, collapse. <laughs> this is the 19th century bearing, a hundred years earlier. And, 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 and I want to tell you this because that's very interesting. <laughs> that's the textbook example of the fate of the acceptance house which was called the House of Bering, Bering Brothers, in fact, and the collapse took place in 1890. The firm Bering Brothers and Company was established in 1763 in London by John and Francis Bering. They were the sons of John Bering, who lived from 1697 to 1748. He was a German a successful German cloth manufacturer who moved to England, in fact to Devon, in 1717 and started a small business there. At first he was importing and exporting uh, rather he was a commissioned agent for importers and exporters so other merchants were doing the exporting and exporting, but they had to have an agent who took care of the uh, uh, paperwork of importing and exporting. But they soon began <coughs> to lend their credit. They, they, in other words, they, they came to England from Germany. They had an expertise in the cloth business, and they started an honest business and a good business, they were competent, they were diligent, all that, and they got a good name. So the goodwill was there. Okay? <laughs> and then, just as my, uh, 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 my man, uh, who was the uh, was the baker, right? The yes. baker. The baker got a brilliant idea. Why do I bother with baking and making fire and firing up the furnace and, uh, and shuffling bread and this and that? Why don't I just sit back and let the money flow to me? Start an acceptance house, you see? I have a good name, so I can sit back and enjoy the rest of my life. Sell my signature and people will buy it, people will pay top money for it. So something like this must have happened. I have studied this a little bit, but not didn't study that well, that the evil intention in, was there in, in, in the Bering brother, uh, brothers wanted to do this from the beginning. But they just thought that it was too much hassle to push cloth. Why not push paper? <laughs> Lighter. <laughs> so, so they soon began to lend their credit in the form of trade acceptances. So it was their credit which they put out. However, they made sure with the collateral security that they could avoid losses if the credit which they used it for was not all sound. So they were involved in financing all kinds of world projects, global projects. One was British war effort against revolutionary France. Later they got a finger in the American Civil War a union against the Confederacy. Uh, they were financing, I think, the North, but uh, that's neither here nor there. In 1890, the firm was still controlled by the Bering family. And that's when it got involved in the Argentinian and Russian government uh, finances. <laughs> and as a result, 
the event bus. Although Baring Brothers and Company was bailed out by the Bank of England as early as 1890, as an acceptance house the firm was finished. Its credit was effectively ruined. And if you want to read more about this, then there is this book, The House of Bering by R. W. Hidi, or Heidi, H I D Y, which was published in 1949. Well, you will get a copy of that, but I just tell you that there, if you are interested, it's a fascinating story. There is, uh, there is literature on that. So I'm, I'm winding up this now with the following comment. If the market knowingly discounted undisguised anticipation and accommodation bills at the same discount rate applicable to real bills, then there would be no basis for objecting against them. But the point is precisely that the market refuses to do so. The market just wouldn't touch these accommodation and anticipation bills, which to me is the ultimate uh, judgment that th these papers are bad, uh, or at least uh, uh, it's not the right place to raise the credit for that purpose. This is why it is necessary to have recourse to non-disclosure and the fraud of misrepresenting the nature and the status of goods on the face of the bill. So you see, uh, this disclosure, non-disclosure uh, dispute which has been going on is also relevant in, in, in our context because a large part of the problem is non-disclosure. There are, there are businesses which think that this is none of your business to learn and they withhold information and they should not be allowed to do so. There should be uh, transparency and for that reason they should be obliged to make full disclosure and that's part of it and that's why the uh, real bill has on its face a full description of the quality quantity of good is being shipped and even the name of the vessel which does the shipping and uh, if insurance is involved then it has to be attached and so on and so forth. It's not because we want to make it more cumbersome. On the contrary, we want to make it very flexible and fluid. But without full disclosure, it's not going to fly. It will fly if you insist on full disclosure, or as full as, um, as practicable under the circumstances. So undisguised accommodation bills would never circulate. Disguised accommodation bills may circulate for a time, thanks to the conspiracy and collusion between the acceptance house and its clients. But, as a rule, the fraud, the fraud comes to light sooner or later. And my closing sentence is a repetition of what I have already said uh, this afternoon. The positive spread between the interest and the discount rate is not there for the picking. <laughs> Thank you. I was just thinking of the uh, remarks of risk and um, borrowing short and lending long, mm -hmm. that uh, part of that risk is uh, uh, having the fraud discovered after you're out of the business. <clears throat> <laughs> in other words, if the, the risk of fraud is delayed later, then you've won. You won. You know, you won. Personally. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay. I, I would put it into very short two sentences. Crime does not pay is not necessarily true. Crime must not pay. And this crime, if it's properly handled, will not pay because of the legislation. So by letting it pay, it grows out of hand and destroys sure. a lot of stuff. Crime must not pay. The floor is open to discussion. We have lots of time. So I've finished early on purpose. I wanted to have, give you a chance to 
Uh, yes. Yeah, I now see it, you know, for a long time since I've been reading your essays for the last five years. Now, only just now that it finally click in because, I mean, I was open to the idea that you had to ban it, but I couldn't see why the market wouldn't bankrupt the people who tried this game anyhow. But now I see it's for the same reason the police have to maintain law and order in the streets. Force or fraud is a threat to the free man. And this is very clearly fraud because you can't, it's misleading investors into thinking that the, the uh, uh, real bill, the 90 day investment that they got, it will be repaid because it's matched by, a, you know, by goods and that's clearly fraud. So anyhow, now, I, now I finally understand that. What I was going to uh, ask you about, but I think I've answered this question too, but I'll just run my answer by you to make sure I understand it. You're banning it for, uh, for a financial institution. They can't uh, borrow short to lend long and, and you, you examine their books. The government has the right to examine their books, but an individual, wouldn't, you wouldn't need to put that restriction on an individual because either he would be a wealthy individual, in which case he'd have the gold to tie up in a long-term investment. He wouldn't need to borrow short. And if he did try and borrow short, if you, if you were running a, if you were running a, a cloth uh, uh, operation, let's say, and he was able to, in the normal course of his business, issue real bills, he would either have to um, issue them uh, against his long-term investment, but then he would need his gold for his inventory. So there would be no... Um, he would not be able to do any anything that would need regulating. He would never be able to do anything wrong. It wouldn't be a natural transaction. Yeah. Well. Well. It, well it, what I mean is, it would not hurt. Um, it would not hurt the social the community the capital yeah. because then he would be using his gold coins to finance his inventory and writing his real bills. And and the and the buyers of his real bills wouldn't really care because one way or another they would get. Um, is that right? They would get there. Uh, there would not be any danger. Like, uh, it's an awkward example. What I mean is, if you had a cloth merchant and he said, "I'm going to keep issuing real bills. I have this pile of gold coins because I'm a profitable merchant. I'm going to keep issuing real bills, and I won't use them to finance my inventory. I'll use them to uh, actually no. That's right. He would never be able to issue them because the only way he could issue them is against his suppliers. So yeah. So you never need to. See, I, I was concerned uh, from a freedom aspect. I'd say, well, let's not have the government have to now overlook all these things and how would they even begin to, you're right, it's a simple matter of anybody that sets himself up in business as a financial institution, uh, they would, I guess, have to be special among all businesses. They would be under special observation by the government, but that would be justifiable the same way that the laws, the legal tender laws, or rather the, um, uh, coin, the coin Act would say, you know, no one can counterfeit, you know, there's, there's, those laws are completely justifiable and so would be laws examining the books of a financial institution. See, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to figure out how it would go because, you know, so many of the gold supporters are very, very anti... Anything. Uh, anti I, any, any, go, any regulation. That's right. They wouldn't want any oversight, but this is, this is justifiable because it's preventing fraud and it has to be, uh, has to be done because the damage is so great. You know, the, the thought here is, it occurred to me, Nathan, when you're discussing that, the thing of regulation of financial institutions. Um, Professor Fekete's uh, um, real bills... Um, thing with commerce itself, that if we went back to a real bill system of self-liquidating debt in the commercial process, there's no need for a financial institution. You oh, see? No, uh, absolutely. Well, well, there's less, less, need, less need to do that because it would liquidate itself. All right. And that um, ultimately this really is the form of self-policing. That the system itself is not policing in a draconian way of somebody looking over your shoulder and see if your P's and Q's are crossed. It's th if does it pass the test? Will the market accept this kind of risk? Will it buy it? Will it accept it? And if it's transparent on the face of it, then it knows the risk is taking. And you, you can right now look at the extreme levels of which we've gone in the opposite direction. Transparency is absurd. Gone it's, it's gone. I mean, it, 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 it's, no one wants to look at it, least of all the people holding the wrist themselves. You, so it's not a matter of transparency. We have, a, it, it, we, there's this little crack and we've gone so far extreme, it's absolutely outrageous of where, of where we are. Yeah, it might, it might be that banks never reappear in the form of the uh, yeah. game. It would only be uh, discount houses and investment clubs where the wealthy would gather and pool their money where everybody knew that it was long-term yeah. money for long-term investments to, you know, to build factories and, and things like that, and uh, we never, the situation would never arise again. Um, but uh, the, uh, as long as the rule, the normal rule is against fraud, as long as you actually put these people in jail, uh, you know, for this kind of uh, uh, fraud or hung them uh, from the, you know,
New York Yard Arm, uh, you'd, you'd never have this kind of uh, large scale uh, uh, defrauding of the public again. Yeah. You know, this rogue trader, the trader business is just a cover up. Cover up for the Their institution they, and the system. That, that, that's because it's incredible that a single trader can run up seven billion uh, in losses and nobody will blow the whistle. Nobody up there. And you know, uh, it's common knowledge that these transactions are scrutinized several times a day and certainly at the end of every trading day. And then, you know, people buy that. Rogue trader made a loss of this bank, that bank, that. Yeah, the commentary I saw was at the whole story. Yeah. If he made seven billion dollar in gains, would somebody blow the whistle? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's just as fraudulent the other way. It just happened that this time they sliced the money into their coffer instead of slicing it out to somebody else. Yeah, that's that's so the fact that I read too. They were they were monitoring him supposedly, and while he was, he was, while he was running profits, they just he was, up. He, was he was up until yeah. the end of the year. Right. Yeah, he was up, right. and then it. Right. Yeah. The casino. Yeah. So the conclusion is that uh, people high up have a vested interest to give the highest mark to the institute and if there is ever a need to blame somebody they find a scapegoat and it could be a lowly trader, just call him a rogue trader and once you give a dog a bad name might as well shoot him. But I can't believe it that we have all these controls and a rogue trader can create losses to that extent. I just can't believe you, it. You know, I, I love that. The, the, there was a case, this is the, the rogue trader case of Society Generale, you know, the one from Paris. <laughs> uh, in, in the fall, there was another case of where a, it was a French bank also in, in New York that had sustained massive losses. But what was fascinating, Antal, was, mm -hmm. uh, was the kid who was doing it there. All right, they're, they're trader, and they, they fired some people in the office for it. He was 31 years old. Mm -hmm. He was 31 years old, and four years before, he had been showing real estate <laughs> apartments in New York. Showing real estate apartments in New York. He had just received his license six months before this thing blew up on him. Mm -hmm. All right, and the truth of the matter is, it's, it's the system itself that is falling apart. Mm -hmm. and, and we'll get some examples like this to blow it up, but really it's a systemic problem. And I, I real, I'm stunned with, I mean, you're right, Nathan, that you've been looking at it for years. We've all been sort of looking at how, how does this thing do it, you know, and, and, and um, I didn't expect, uh, Professor, to actually, uh, that there was an end point like this, that you actually had it down to the, the place of where it started from. And, and I think you're probably right that it didn't start from intentional fraud. It just started out from the human propensity to, well, my God, I mean, this works. But what, what, what let it grow so big was the government, the government backing it up and taking part, part in it. it to finance it. See, that was the brilliance of their move, of the and banker's move. And, 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 and if you kept that out with laws that only gold and silver are money and there shall be no other bills of credit emitted or however they uh, phrase yeah, it, phrase it. You, would never really, you, know, you could still have the laws on the books against borrowing short to lend long, but they would probably never get to the point, you know, an, an acceptance house would never grow up to that kind of size. Uh, you would ever need to see it. It was. Uh, well, you, it was and that, that was the point that I, I, I came to the clues, that really what transformed everything was the collusion between in Western history, because this is Western history, the collusion that happened in the 18th century, in some, you know, 19th century between banking and government. It was, it was massive, the effects. Yes, please. Professor. You have indicated that interest rates uh, will continue to fall and to have themselves because that will continue to be profitable in the in the bond market and yet conventional Austrian wisdom has been that interest rates will have to spike because if we use say John Williams numbers we've got 12 percent inflation and I've got a long-term bond of of four percent we saw in the case of Asia in the Asian collapse of, of uh, Indonesia and Thailand and so on, their interest rates did spike overnight. They went from, you know, like mm. five five percent to seventeen, eighteen percent. Can you synthesize for me 
what I'm missing. How come they did spike there, and they and they're not going to spike here? Uh, I think the answer is not too complicated. The, uh, what you should compare is the bond market in the United States and the bond market in Indonesia or Thailand or whatever. I mean, it's either non-existent or so tiny that it's no consequence, whatever happens there. So sure, local interest rates did spike, but that's as far as it went. It didn't go any further. There was no spillover. But in the United States, it's very different because <clears throat> we have an unprecedented big bond market, which in itself, the size of the bond market in the United States is roughly 10 times the size of the stock market, which is big, we, we agree, okay. And that's only, still only, the tip of the iceberg, because the rest of the iceberg is underwater, that's bond insurance, the derivatives iceberg, that's Invisib invisible to most individuals. So, to answer your question, it boils down to the interconnectedness of all this structure, the <coughs> bond market, the insurance, and so on. In the U.S. dollar denominated bond market, and it's very, very big. And now you can argue whether this uh, one half quadrillion dollars is, what's the word, no, no, not nominal value. Notional. Notional. No, they invented a perfectly good word and gave it a, 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 no meaning. This is, this is meaningless to use it in this notional value. Well, it's a question, if, if you have a loss, do you have to pay up? Or you can say, well, I take my marbles back and let's call it a quit. Let's call it a day. Everybody takes his own marble back and the game is finished. It's not like that. Then it would be notional whether you win or not, because the marbles have to be given back to each player at the end of the game. But it's real, it's not notional, because if you lose, then you have to pay up. And there would be no uh, subprime crisis, there would be no commercial paper market crisis, and SIV and all these uh, artificial words, if it was not notional, because you say, okay, so I lost, but give my marbles back, because tomorrow will be another day. <laughs> so that's the answer. In the U.S., we have this huge global bond market, all denominated in U.S. dollars, and interest rate as such is meaningless. It doesn't matter whether it's 4%, 5%. The point is that it has to fall, and as long as it does fall, there is free, uh, risk-free profit made available to the banks, because the banks have an appreciating bond portfolio, so they can cover the losses. By the way, going back to the previous question on Japan and how they um, uh, uh, hush up uh, and wall, uh, stonewall the losses of these big Japanese banks is that the government makes sure that the interest rate, however low they are, are still falling. falling. A little bit, but they are falling. They are not falling by several uh, points, they are falling by a fraction of a point, but they are falling and that's all you need to make the game of musical chair continue. That's all you need, falling interest rate. So it doesn't matter at what level it is. Could be very high, could be mid, middle ground or very low. As long as interest rate is falling, the, uh, the game of musical chair can continue. And that's what's happening. And you can't play that or replay that in Thailand or 
or the Philippines or any other country. It has to be. And that, I believe, will make the dollar survive longer than most people are willing to uh, predict. I don't think the dollar will collapse overnight because the bond market will not. There is vested interest to keep the game of musical chess going. If you know it's going to keep falling, that's why it keeps pulling on to it more derivatives because right. you know it's yeah. risk free, so it just keeps yeah. stacking them up and we yeah. up your position. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I was going to say maybe another way of, uh, if I'm correct here, another way of looking at it is if John Williams is right, if the true inflation rate is 12%, let's say, as long as the hedge funds playing the yen carry trade can continue <laughs> to make at least 12% or 13% on their bonds. Then Who it's cares still, about the loss on, on the face value of That's the right, then, then, it, then it's still free money for them, even mm -hmm. if the amount is smaller. And they're probably making, because they're leveraged up so high, they're probably making much more than 12 or 13 percent <laughs> uh, on it. So that's the way I explain. When advisors ask me what's the long rate mean, that's the way, that's what I always say. I say, well, you have two things that determine the price of a stock or a bond, fundamental and short-term money flows. Fundamentally, yeah, bond. If it's if it's yielding five percent and inflation is uh, uh, you know twelve percent, it has to fall in value. The interest rate has yeah, to. Yeah, but that's for the birds. Yeah. But that's, that's right. for the birds. But that's, but that's long. The real run. thing. Or the long fundamental short term, it's the money flow, and as it's long as the money flow, flow is yeah. still in the long term, we're all dead. Bonds, are, not only will the price principle. be effective, uh, uh, stable, it'll keep falling. So that's the way I explain it to them. And so no, if we have the bubble keeps keeps growing, the reason the money supply growth around the world is keeps accelerating to 15 minutes because the bubble is so much larger. We have to pump that much more into the system every year just to keep this, as a percentage, this bubble, yeah. to keep it going larger yeah. and larger. So For we shouldn't sure. be surprised when the money supply rates grow from, I think you were reading yesterday, 15, 16 percent. They'll go to 20, 25 percent. Just as the bubble gets larger, they have to. It's competitive devaluation. You made the point to zero. You know, you can uh, put some positive spins on all this, in my opinion, and I think maybe, you know, it, I, uh, not that I want to do it, but uh, one positive spin, when you have the world basically coming to a free market from a Western culture that dominated the free market, I don't think you necessarily have to say competitive devaluation to zero. You say competitive devaluation to a benchmark. And what is that benchmark? Let's discuss that. If it's competitive, there should be a, a currency that's a benchmark. It's most likely the Chinese currency. If, if you're going to have uh, an increase, we call it a bubble, we call it its liquidity. Okay? And we say, in the long run, we're all, we're all dead. In principle, people take, you know, you take, you say a long bond, and the print, uh, nobody's really concerned with the principal. You just said it. You know, if you've got a 12% yield, you're looking at cash flow. Okay, we'll worry about the principal later. But if somebody wants to pick up with me and say this is a topic that should be considered, I, I think you don't have competitive devaluation to zero, and that's why, in the long run, the dollar. You said it. You said longer is not forever. Not long. No, longer is not forever. Longer is not forever. That's why, you know, I think the free markets, it just the world's embracing the free markets and competitive value. We're saying there's a competition in currency. And gold is, I mean, you can't say it's ignored. It's a benchmark. We have, you know, it's in a free market. Well, I, well, I shouldn't say free market. Yeah, that's okay. I, I wanted to point out there. Free market, well, boy. It's controlled. Okay. It's good, okay, okay. controlled it's free market. But, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. look at the Russians, look at the Chinese. Let's say it's undervalued. It's, a, okay. it's, a, it's the ultimate currency. You can say the inverted pyramid, et cetera, et cetera. But I, I just, that's one point. Somebody tell me if I'm off base. But to me, in, in that notion of competitive devaluations, I, w I wouldn't say to zero, I would say to what's the most competitive currency. The problem is the dollar it, opening the world economy, there's just going to be a lot of dislocations. So yeah. are you saying that the Chinese can have a positive benchmark without appealing to gold or silver? 
and to say, okay, well, you need a we policing make, mechanism. Yeah, I think you know you have to have the floating currencies. In principle, this is a question of what's amoral or moral behavior. I think if people all act morally and in their own self-interest economically, let's say we have uh, moral behavior in the world. It, there is a competitive currency there, there, that can be a benchmark. Whether it's linked to gold or silver, it's probably a good idea. But you could say, ideally, it could happen. Yeah, but longer is not forever. So if it's a benchmark for a year, what happens after? You know, I mean, I don't see, honestly, I cannot see the Chinese currency to escape the dynamics of competitive currency devaluation without without uh, opening their mint to silver or gold. And actually they are in an They're extremely good it. and strong position yeah, to do just that. Do that. So it's just a matter of, for them to recognize that they, uh, they could just abolish this whole farce which is going on in Western civilization. And I I'm sorry that the Japanese were in that position too and they let it go. Uh, a decade ago and they blew it so badly and mm -hmm. actually despicably because they were sycophants of the US Treasury. Why couldn't one guy get up in Japan and say that's not right? For the same reason that you said in Hungary <laughs> that Germany and Japan are occupied countries, occupied countries economically if not military. And they are occupied militarily. And the, um, yeah, I'm going to get back to thinking about China. All right, it's very interesting about very interesting. Uh, very interesting about what the China card and what they're going to do. The Chinese are real late to this game. They they just sort of like, oh, what? The waking giant. They, the waking they they waking giant, and and they came in very late in this. Um, I I really don't like. The, the use of the word free markets. Okay, we our markets did move tending towards. Tending towards. Okay, yeah, they were they were originally free markets. Mm. They they were in fact what I liked about it. Your, your story triggered things in me that it, that these bills arose in Manchester, which was the home of the Industrial Revolution. Mm. These are local exchanges. Yeah, so but no, 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 no. But that didn't matter. They were they were big because the Industrial Revolution brought brought economics above the local level. They were trading cloth everywhere. Okay, okay? so this was a, an adaptation of life, civil life, to a, a greater need. Okay, what then happened? And really where the fly got in the ointment was the bankers, by colluding with government, figured out a way where they didn't have to work. You know, I mean, they could take risks with other people's money, and they insinuated themselves in every part of the thing and basically are bringing it <coughs> the system down to its knees. And so this is the system that now China has awoken into. I mean, just sort of as it woke up, it was highly futile. It was entrenched in the past, all right? And what's very curious about China, they're very mercantilistic. These people love to buy and sell, all right? They, they call them the Jews of the East. They, they go into markets and they, they like to get in there, like to bet, they like to produce. And, but they're very, excuse me, weak in terms of their, their power lies in the present, all right? Their position in the present, I mean, their power lies in the future. Their present position is very, very tenuous. Very tenuous, okay? 20 years ago, Nobody ever would have thought that China would have these $1.2 trillion in foreign reserves. Where do they get it from? How do they get that much money? All right? The Japanese tried to get foreign reserves, and they were stymied, and they did get them. But what happened is that everybody else saw them as a threat because they were Japanese corporations taking over the world economy. Nobody saw that China as a threat because they were multinational corporations using China as a, as a cheap labor base and distorted and took over the world economy, all right? But because labor is such a high component, money, equity, savings flowed, and they weren't even savings, it's paper dollars, flowed from the consuming societies into the producing society. The producing society ironically happened to be a saving society. Nobody expected this. 
All right, and and the people who are in charge of keeping that thing going just thought the economy would keep going. But what the Chinese and the Japanese and the Indians, when they got these pools of capital, they sat on. They didn't go out and buy, you know, they, they, they did they didn't. They, they, they sort of shocked everybody. How come you're not coming over buying this stuff? Because their whole thing is to be stable, to save. They came out of total weakness, all right, absolute financial insecurity, and just want to sit on their pile for a while so they can feel that they've got some security. They don't feel secure yet. They don't feel secure. So their currencies are going towards the bottom, but they don't understand currencies yet. They, they're sitting there trying to grasp what's going on. They're trying to figure out how, how the game works. Uh, the Japanese have a good generation on the Chinese in terms of experiencing the Western capital system, the market system. The Chinese just barely woke up. I think the Chinese are so far ahead of us. Well, they, 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 I mean, they're, they're taking these treasuries and they're, they're monetizing them by you know, buying up all the productive resources right now in Brazil and Africa. They're building out infrastructure in, in Africa. They've agreed. Unlike America, where America said, well, we'll go to Africa in exchange for the resources we want, your sure. gold and your silver and your platinum, China said, no, 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 we, we'll come to Africa and we'll support not just the precious metals and, and oil, which is what America wants, but we'll also support your entire agricultural business because we want that as well. So, I mean, I think they are 10 moves ahead of us. Well, in, in that respect they are, but in the same very, very respect when they created the Sovereign Wealth Fund with $200 billion, two, what is it, $2 trillion, $2 trillion uh, not two, $200 billion, $200 billion. 200 billion. when they went in and decided to do with it, they, they put a bunch of money into Blackstone, got burned immediately, all right? The next thing they did, they put some money into some U.S. investment banks, got uh, and are, you know, they're making their 11% or 9%, but the, the Chinese now put a, 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 they stopped it. That one of the Chinese banks was supposed to put two billion bucks in another bank, and they were stopped from doing it. Well, as a, if, if this is a benchmark, how can it be growing 13 or 15 or whatever percent you said a year? That's the problem. If it was actual silver there, it could be a benchmark. If the yuan was backed by silver, it would be, and maybe where they're going. But at this moment, it's one of the fastest growing. Uh, uh, money supply in the world. When the, you know when there's no benchmark, you know when there's no value, when you can just print, when the only cost to your go government is is paper and ink, all right, and 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 the more you print, and there's and, and the only way that pe that there's any type of control on it is the foreign exchange markets where they're betting on uh, whether it's going up and down. Then it behooves you to put more in circulation. I mean, if you want to try and be conservative and be and, and hold a benchmark, you'll end up like the Swiss in 1980. You'll get killed in foreign exchange markets. Your goods will get expensive. People will know these are prudent. These are benchmark for a currency. And all of a sudden you get priced out of the market. The everybody as to the effect of forces that are unleashed and beyond everybody else. Everybody, I don't care how powerful you are, I don't care what central bank you're in, I don't care what kind of economy you are, I don't care if the Chinese, Japanese, European, we are all in, all of us are in this thing that's bigger than any of us, and it's just rushing. There's, there's no stability. Frank, well, I, I, I mean, I would agree with you. Oh, sorry, did you want to answer that? Or? No, I, I, yeah, just one quick thought. We're so far away from equilibrium in the way of currencies, and that's why it's a very... You know, it's a it's a going to be a, a, a volatile time, and I think you know uh, when these cultures where China is today uh, and where they were 20, 30 years ago, as the doctor had said. I mean, they're in the bottom market as deep as anybody, and they've been right. You know, yeah. to say they're you know they're they're just learning the game. I don't buy that. I would I would go with Jim's point of view. Uh, they're you know they're in the driver's seat, but the currencies. If you, if you have extreme equilibrium, you're going to have a lot of dislocations, and it's not you're not in a free market. I, you know, the people there's some good control, and then there's some nefarious control, and we talk, we're stressing all the nefarious controls, and I kind of side with that way. But you know, maybe if there's some positive, if you have if you accept the fact there's significant dis disequilibrium, and but there will come this these adjustments will come. Uh, then, then maybe there's some hope, and maybe this whatever the forever is, is still a long time away. Well, Frank, I, I could agree with you about the paper currencies not going to zero, not all going to zero, but 
it would take, like, the brokers ask me this sometimes, you know, Nathan, maybe, you know, what, like, how could you ever see a, there was an institution I presented to uh, last month where they said, tell me, if you know, play devil's advocate against yourself, tell me how the whole system might not collapse, and you might be dead wrong about gold, and I said, well, okay, maybe what, you know, could happen is, if the United States started dismantling its welfare state, if it, you know, withdrew from all foreign entanglements, if it began to behave very responsibly, then perhaps, you know, and balance its tax revenues and everything, mm -hmm. then perhaps people would have confidence that the paper dollar would be, would not lose value. And of course, if they also stopped issuing, you know, uh, uh, money to simply lubricate the economy, then yeah, maybe you would have, uh, you know, the, the whole system would stabilize. And we don't see any signs of that or not too No, and, and so, or yeah. the other alternative, uh, you know, that I offer these people, as I said, well, the other way that you could have a stabilization of foreign exchange rates is at some point the, the major countries in the world would get together and say, okay, everybody take however much, however much gold you have in your central bank vaults, say that you will now back your currency and your immediate debts, uh, your, your immediate uh, government uh, debts, not, not your long-term social security obligations and things like that, but just your debts. Immediately back it, 100% with gold. Tell anybody that if they want, they can turn their money in for bullion, and that would probably, you know, most people, well, I don't know, it's hard to predict, but if, if there was that guarantee in place and you had a gold price of $40,000 an ounce or whatever it is, it might stabilize the currency as well, and you would never need to, uh, you know, have a, have a financial crisis. But uh, it's unlikely that these governments, I think, are willing to do either of those things. And so therefore, that's why I do think we're headed to zero for all paper. Yeah, all the U.S. is not in a position of strength. That, that would be obvious. And the doctor's point would be, eventually, will somebody all open the gold and silver window? And anybody that would do it would have to do it from a position of strength. So it seems It's not the window you have to open. It's the mint. <laughs> the, you know, the Chinese are, are moving, and I'm not saying they're going to do it, but the, the Chinese have a long history of gold. These, these folks but really silver. do. And silver, they do. They, mostly silver. Yeah, mostly silver. silver. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, 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 and what they've done is they have, in incremental steps, they've opened up the retail market to bullion to people in China. That's enormous. No, is, That's it, it, yeah, enormous. and they did it consciously. They didn't do it. This is not a little thing that they did. No. I believe that somewhere they they they're they're looking for some stability. All right, and they conscious. You know, the Chinese don't move. I mean, no. when they move, it's just it's you know. But they did this very consciously. It's a way for the whole nation to, yeah, to, to weather gold, to weather. To get ready yeah, to, for what they that is coming. And they did this, all right? The Chinese, so what they've done is that they've now, they've now consciously made this available to their population, to their, as a, as a form of savings. Stores. Huh? In the department stores. As department stores sell gold, bullion. And, and so this is something, this is, this is, this is a, a, the result of a conscious desire by the Chinese to help, to help save themselves. I, I think they know in the back of their mind, they're very fearful of, wh of what they're into, and they know they're not in control. They have a strong position. They know they're not in control. I don't think they're that fearful. Oh, they, they are. I, I, okay. they, you know, the fear yeah. is that we have a collapse of the re world's reserve currency. I mean, it, without yeah. any standard. And sure. That's, the, that's where it, there has to be, like, shocking change. And so, you know, where is it going to go to? Just to say it's all going to fall apart, you know, it may all fall, fall apart and uh, somebody puts the pieces back together, but it just could be a rare, very jolting transition to a new order. You've got to go where, what's, what, what current, what nations, let's, we're talking nationality. Yeah. I mean, you could have the Amero, you know, maybe you pull it together, you know, things go to hell for 10 years and the North Americans come back and say, uh, you know, we're producing trade surpluses again and, and, uh, uh, you know, but that's that that's a bigger reach for me than saying China's in a position to do this now, and the Russians. Are, yeah, I'm done. Go ahead. I mean, it, I mean, it, it's not like the, it's not like this is happening by accident. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't have all these bright people who screw up consistently for a hundred years. I mean, the game afoot here is is one world government. I mean, so this collapse had first you had to spread. The disaster worldwide. You couldn't restrict it to one country. You wouldn't get your one world government. So you had to make sure everybody got indebted. You had to make sure that, that you passed the subprime on to Europe. You had to make this very, very bad. And then you have to keep pumping the bubble. 
and you have to pump the bubble to the place that when you collapse it worldwide, you then stand up and say, we the governments of the world are banding together as one government with a solution and we're going to do it based on electronic currency and so now we will take all this agony away for you people and we're going to, well, you know, how they'll figure out how they're going to allocate something to people. But I mean, this isn't some sort of accident. I mean, I just don't believe in the accident theory of history. I mean, this is this is ultimately to consolidate the yeah. world under one world government. No, no different than the euro was to bring together those those countries under one currency. The Amero was to bring together North and South America. The Asians are talking about a single currency, and then they're just going to slam them all together and say, "Oh, one currency. Let's make it electronic, and then we'll have even more control over humanity." Well, to say the the Bilderbergs are the one world idea can can actually control the Chinese and the Russians. I guess we'll see. Well, they're members of the Bilderbergs. It's no, not they like are. they're outside. They are. They're outside. No. They are. No. no. They're outside. I, I have no doubt that there are many bureaucrats that dream of that kind of. Uh, uh, and, oh, and this and is bureaucrats. But, or rather, okay, very, very wealthy men then. But yeah, I doubt that, uh, like you said, the technology, I mean, half of, you know, half of Americans don't even have um, uh, a high-speed internet at home yet, I don't think, I don't think. Uh, so, I mean, you're, the time wouldn't be right for, um, for them to have a fully electronic current, I mean, you know, to plant chips and everyone to be able to track their bank balance and things like that. I don't think that their timing is quite right for the... Uh, There's an opportunity for the West to go that way, but the, you know, the, so much of the world has embraced the market economy. I mean, to me, that's the biggest change in the last 30 years. You're talking, you know, we're losing population, the Russians are losing some, but the Chinese and the Indians and that part of the world, I mean, you're talking, you're talking three billion people. I mean, there's just, if you can convince me that they're just embracing a market economy and they're going to be able to be uh, uh, subverted to this. I, I don't know. I, I don't know the Indian culture that well or the Chinese, but it seems to me that they're embracing a market economy and, and uh, that's what we know. If I can, uh, uh, this may be of interest to non Canadians or maybe some of the Canadians too, if uh, you uh, the. Uh, you can speak to Canadians, they're all in here. You, you mentioned it, uh, Daryl, about the asset back commercial paper, and I wasn't sure whether you were referring to, in particular, the Canadian situation that's been unfolding. Yeah. I've lost sales because of it, and I, you know, I try not to rub it in the faces of the advisors, because I, you know, a lot of them I talk to. Because you like your job. Day, day day, and, you know, and I warned them, yeah. and then, uh, you know, as they started to show some interest, in August, all of a sudden, their commercial paper was frozen. Gone, frozen. Their accounts. Yeah. I mean, uh, in Canada, it's about $33 billion of face value worth of asset-backed commercial paper that's frozen. For Canada, that's a big that's deal. That's huge. That's a big deal. I mean, multiply that number by 12, you know, maybe, or 15 to make equivalent American uh, mm -hmm. size. And the way the story has happened is that, like you said, this is what made me think of it again, Darrell, when you said these people are afraid to even know what the, what the assets are. They're trying to work out, so it was 90-day, I think, paper. Yeah. It froze in August when the credit crunch started. And these people, the clients have been patiently waiting for some kind of resolution to happen. Nothing's happened. The date kept getting postponed, postponed, postponed. The latest that I heard was that the solution that they were trying to get all the parties to agree to was convert this to five to eight year floating rate notes. Floating rate notes. And maybe you'll get your money back in five to eight years. And by the way, if you want out right now, there was a very small market that sprung up, 60 cents bid, 90 cents offer. And this was supposed to be completely liquid 90-day paper. So of course the lawsuit, a lot of people are getting their lawyers revved up, ready to sue in all directions. But the, um, the I, I attended a very special uh, presentation on it for a guy who used to package this kind of stuff and he works for a brokerage house in a different line of work. But he said, yeah, he said that the reason it's getting so long to work out is that even in these high-level conferences where they're trying to work out the details, the people that issue the paper keep saying, well, we're not actually gonna tell you what the assets are in that paper because you know we don't have to and we don't feel comfortable and you know we don't want to do that you know sure suggesting that it sure. is so bad it is so much toxic it is because you see they started out saying well only a small amount of it's subprime that you know that's at risk the rest of it's normal but we don't want to unbundle it we don't want to untangle it all but they steadfastly refused and so there's still no resolution to the best of my knowledge and none is i think one piece of paper traded at 70 cents on the dollar out of this you know probably a, a few million dollars worth out of this 33 billion so, I mean, it's not really fair to say that that's what the market's valuing it at, but that's the only transaction that's happened. But that's the beginning of, I think, what the professor was talking about, or rather, um, 
I guess, uh, Professor, it was you talking about uh, John Exter's idea of a, of, a, of a split. You know, b before we have silver going into backwardation as a warning that gold is going into backwardation, the warning that will come before that is a split between the cash, the folding paper bills, yeah. liquidity, and, yeah. bills, and more exotic things like, well, not a bank balance is exotic, but something like a, a AAA piece of asset backed commercial paper will suddenly now be worth, you know, 60 cents on the dollar, and maybe yeah. a treasury bill will go to a premium yeah. rather than a discount. So I think that's the. In Canada, you're seeing the very first. I, I don't know what things are happening in the United States, but in Canada, you're seeing the very first signs you of are. that now. It's, it's more. It's, it's, Canada has been more affected by it, but I think it's just emblematic that we've had already a tremendous destruction of wealth in the West. Tremendous. The only the only thing is we don't know how big it is. Big. They don't want to open up the lid. No. All right. They don't want to open up the lid. That doesn't mean that those animals in it are alive. <laughs> All right. They're just holding the lid on it. Okay, and they know everybody knows that there's trouble in there, and they just they're sitting on it. Exactly. That lid is going to come up. Well, one, it starts stinking so, so badly bad. that <laughs> one of the, one of the things that was very interesting was the thing about Japan is that the Japanese are they they follow things. Okay, they just they follow and and the 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 the, the triple A you know imprimatur that was given to debt instruments, since the Japanese make no money on their own government bonds, they've all f gone in search of yield. And, and th the feeling is, is and, and this is why their markets have absolutely died since October. Foreign money has fled Japan. The investment money has fled Japan just as much and almost as it did in, in, in Thailand in 1997. They're out of there. And they're out of there because they believe that with the new accounting rules, Japan is, they're supposed to, I mean, who knows whether they're going to do it or not, but they're supposed to come clean by the end of March and say how much they have in subprime, how much they have in toxic debt, and actually mark to market their losses. And the rumors have been floating through the investment community, and they, they, they're out of there. They're out of there. So we, you know, we are in just some amazing times. Could I ask one question of this whole crowd? There's a little bit of different levels, and I, I kind of lean towards what Jim said. If or when the whole thing collapses and there's extreme economic pain, and we go to this trough, what will then rise out of it? Will it be a single world currency, or will it be gold? That's the question. I mean, this whole thing is always... I think if you look at the financial system, you're only looking at a portion of the elephant. I mean, if you look at the pharmaceutical system, if you look at the education system, and you look at the financial system, you look at uh, uh, organized religion, you will see that there is a continual pattern, and the pattern that is being fought for here isn't about finances. This is all about freedom. It's all about being free or not free. And if you look at something that's consistent over the last thousand years of this planet, these people have consistently lost freedom. You know, after World War I, you get the, you know, the League of Nations. After World War II, you get the United Nations. I mean, Clinton acts through the United Nations. I mean, that pattern is in place. So, to me, this is, this is I mean, gold's important to me because it's about freedom. This is all about freedom of humanity to be free. So that's my view. But fess up, Jim. So after fess, World yeah. War III, we have world government. No, 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 no. He did. Underneath, the, no, well, that's not true. Well, that, that's that not true. Humanity will become free. Yes. That, that, so I do believe will prevail. Yes. Yeah, see, that's what it was. Because we had our conversation yesterday. No, yeah, as no I was so dim, you know, blaming this thing that Jim said. He he believed that there are counter influences of, and there are. I absolutely believe those counter influences too. And I also believe in the overriding intent of power elites to co consolidate power. But I think we're going to come out of this better. I think we're going to we're going to come out so far better we can't even conceive of it. Absolutely. But this is going to be a hair wrenching shift to a corner. I'm going to slide through this vehicle that you know we're you know you talk about a power slide going through the corner. We're going to lose. It's going to it's going to appear to us that we've lost control. We're going to go to peace and harmony on Earth like has not yes. existed in a thousand years. Yeah. But, but you're right. I mean, we're really going to have to. We're really going to have to uh, stay out of fear to to be able to manage this and yes. help everybody through the transitions. The transitions can, it's going to be scary and bumpy. 
Thank you very much. Thank Ladies you. Gentlemen, no, I, I learned That's just intense. as much as I try to pass on. It's, it's amazing, yeah, but uh, give and take yeah. is, uh, is very a very secret. Man. And, 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 and uh, let and us tell you, for you guys. Like, like trade yeah. itself, the flow is yeah. <laughs> yours in yeah. another direction. <laughs> okay, yeah. we'll uh, meet again tomorrow morning. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.